essentially, I'm going to brag a little bit about it. We got glowing reviews. It showed that we reduced the expenditure $16 million a year. Um, we, we, we often have people come in and say that we're not cutting government back. We're spending more and more money. But, but you know, the numbers kind of don't. They, they tell the truth, which is, as our uh, auditor said, $16 million a year is not a light reduction. Um, so we've done pretty well that way. Also showed that we've been continuing to invest in infrastructure, with most, which most lo local governments haven't been able to do, and we've done that without bonding, providing debt. We've done it within our, our budget, um, which builds the cap county's uh, net assets. It makes us more marketable for debt, and we have been able to go out and refinance debt and save millions of dollars because of those kinds of activities. Our library debt, uh, bond debt, we've refunded a couple times. We've done the airport revenue bonds, and we're going to refinance those again here. And it literally has saved millions of dollars. Um, and then finally, which is interesting, is um, next year we're required to book, according to GASB 68, um, our pension position, our net pension position. And our auditors report that with PERS, Jackson County will report a net asset. Now that's huge because you hear a lot of people talk about PERS and how it's unfunded. In our case, we're going to book an asset, which means we have additional funding over what the li uh, future uh, liability will be. Um, a couple of reasons. One is we set up a site account about seven years ago where we took cash and invested it along with PERS, which wasn't limited to the government growth rate. We were allowed to earn the same rate as the uh, entire plan earned. Um, that $9 million got us $20 million in reductions over 20 years, which is huge. And then also, more uh, significantly, the changes, the, the recent changes in PERS that are being contested, right? Well, so we're, we're still waiting for the uh, Oregon Supreme Court to rule on that and the large return on investments the last couple of years put us in a positive position. I don't know if you remember this for those who weren't here, but for those who are here, about five or six years ago, we were had a $30 million, roughly a $30 million unfunded act, uh, future actuary liability. So we went from $30 million in the hole to a net uh, position, positive position, which is, <coughs> to me, pretty significant. Um, my guess is we won't see PERS start to reduce the rates until they insure all local governments because it is a shared plan and are, are um, not in a negative position with their future uh, actuary liability. Uh, and also, um, probably until they gain a fund balance so that they have something to work with as they move forward. No one, I think, will, well, actually, pre people will probably complain once PERS is overfunded. Um, you know, a lot of people complain that it's underfunded and it's draining the system, but now, in Jackson County's case, at least. And I, I do suspect many, if not all, local governments will show a positive uh, position. Um, specifically with regard to their future actuarial liability. Some government agencies still have what's called transitional liabilities from when they moved from whatever system they were in into PERS and owed a debt. That's calculated separately from the liability. Um, just a quick overview with a couple of the things that we went over in December, just to uh, bring you back. We did project, <coughs> we, we updated the current projection for property tax base, which was 1% higher than we projected in last, in the current fiscal year's budget, and then um, added this year's growth for what we would determine would be revenue in this budget. So about 5.7% increase over last year, over what we budgeted last year. Mm -hmm. About a 4.75% increase over um, actual. Uh, we set the budget targets at 3.5% increase so in other words we didn't use the whole tax rate in the budget targets and then uh, for the departments that generate a revenue we set their target at 1.5 percent so we expected that we would see growth in those departments um, virtually all of the departments came in at or under their budget target we had a couple one that came in three thousand dollars over their budget target and I'll explain that when we get there but um, so essentially, the budget targets that you all agreed to that we discussed in December 
we've met. Um, net, we came in under, but there, as I said, there was one um, department. Now, there are some requests in the budget, of, uh, which we'll go over, that are things that we didn't talk about in December. The biggest one being ballot scanners for the clerk's office, but I'll cover that when we get to the clerk's budget. And we have a carryover uh, request in our development services uh, department for that software program they've been working on for already, over a year now to automate the planning uh, uh, application process. <clears throat> so county administration budget, I think I've saved us a whopping uh, 10 minutes here to go through it. Oh, I guess board commissioners. Don't <coughs> so, no, no, let me skip that. <laughs> okay, so the board, the board of commissioners uh, came in about forty dollars over their budget target in the general fund. Um, their target was forty-six thousand eight hundred and two dollars. So I explain this a lot. It really uh, is not a, a huge burden on the general fund for. The commissioners because their cost allocated across all funds uh, they're the, the cost of their position there aren't a lot of changes in the budget the um, pros in terms of the uh, program purpose and um, information I did uh, send out to the commissioners and got some feedback uh, changed and updated that the biggest change you'll see and Dick you always ask me this is they went from five staff in their budget to 5.55 staff in their budget 0.5 of that they've already added. It was added um, in November or December of last year before the current board came on. And it was added because of an increase in workload and it's mostly associated with travel because this, at the time, Commissioner Breidenthal was doing a lot more traveling than the board had done and joined a lot of national um, groups. And, and the travel, the coordination, the reimbursement, the scheduling and those types of things <clears throat> we actually have a full explanation of all of the things that increase in terms of workload but that was the biggest impact um, how do you add a point five I mean in real term it's half time we went from oh, having a half time and moving it to a full time yeah. we have five FTE but more than five people in their budget so we have people that are working part time that we bumped up in this put that position between the board of commissioners and the construction. Well, actually, I'm going to say the 0.5, the 0.5 we didn't, or that was all board. No, but that person is in there. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but they were already there. We didn't add. Um, so that was 0.5 of the 0.55. The other 0.5 is a result of us losing the library service. We're not going to have the library staff anymore, and that staff had 0 0.10 time assigned to it, and we split that 0 0.10 between the board of commissioners at 0 0.05 and county administration at 0 0.05. Mm -hmm. So those are essentially, and I don't know if any of you have any questions about that, but feel free to shoot if you want. I'll be the only other salaries and wages. What's the biggest cost? For travel and training. Travel and training is what went up the most. And, you know, we do expect, I mean, uh, Commissioner Breidenthal is representing the county with the board support at multiple different, you know, national organizations. Uh, he's on the Western Interstate Region Board. He's a liaison to NACO. He's Oregon's public safety liaison to NACO. Um, he's on AOC, multiple legislative committees. I mean, he's doing a lot of the traveling. Uh, and he has discussed each of those with the board, and the board has agreed to that, so it's not. And I do expect, um, you know, our new commissioners to do some traveling, more so than did our past two commissioners who were out of office. They kind of just chose to not participate at that level. And not probably as significant as Commissioner Breidenthal because he's representing the county on most of those things, but certainly uh, potentially attending NACO conferences and AOC for sure. Um, and then there are various liaison assignments that the board have that will require them to participate in travel. Okay. Everybody all right if I move on? <coughs> Oh, 
Okay, so county administration, uh, every program that I'm going to go over, which is uh, county administrator, facility maintenance, human resources, economic and special development, um, and uh, water master all hit or came in lower than their budget target with the exception of um, economic and special development and I'll explain that when I get there. Economic and special development actually let me make sure I got the right line here. <coughs> you know 43 I found my eyes are starting to go. <laughs> I'm not believing yeah, I know this. Yeah it's economic and special development okay. So, um, yeah. let, me, let me say in county administration, I already spoke to the point oh five that got added in FTE. It's really a transfer from the library of the point one oh that was split between the board of commissioners and CAO, so point zero five each. Um, we're not adding someone, it's someone who's already here that we're reassigning the FTE to. Uh, in economic and special development, and I'm, I'm skipping some of these because they're just, there's no change at all. So community development block grants, no change. Uh, in economic and special development, this is where OSU extension used to reside. So we did cut back that 204,000, if I remember correctly, that we used to fund them. Um, you'll recall in December, you had a, a pretty, um, significant discussion about the fact that the board of commissioners, the previous board of commissioners, had decided to increase funding to so ready by $175,000 a year on top of the $26,000 we were already providing them and uh, agreed conceptually to enter into an agreement with um, Mark Von Holly uh, at $100,000 a year. Those were for multiple years. Those got put into economic and special development. Um, and so the $204,000 that we were able to reduce our budget by because of the uh, extension district got replaced by 275,000 in additional char charges uh, based on the board's desire to fund level economic development. Um, I will say in this budget now we have entered into an agreement with so ready already in the current fiscal year for their agreement. We have not entered into a contractual agreement with Mark Von Holly. And this board of, the new board of commissioners met with Mark Von Holly and have referred that proposal for review to the uh, economic, uh, economic Development Advisory Committee. So they're gonna kind of go through and see if they even wanna recommend that the boards can you know, support it or not. The, the ask of the 100,000 was reduced to 60,000 uh, currently. What we're going to essentially do is put, leave the 100000 in the budget as a placeholder, but we're going to remove um, that it will be a specific contract with Mark Von Holly's company because the board hasn't decided that. But we're going to have a placeholder for funding in case they do decide to enter into some agreement with someone, whether it be Mark Von Holly or not. That is something for the budget committee to discuss, and I think that um, Commissioner Roberts mentioned I was gone, but I, I was told that she mentioned that she would like to have the budget committee discuss this as well. So I think probably it's highly likely that before even, and I don't know if it'll get to the budget process for the economic development advisory committee's done with it. I, I, it's probably going to take them a couple meetings before they would be prepared to make a recommendation. So it may come to the budget committee before we have a recommendation, but it certainly will be a discussion for you all. But that's what happened in economic and special development essentially. So it went from it went from three hundred and seven thousand four hundred forty-one dollars to three hundred and eighty-one thousand. So we, we cut out two hundred and four, but we added one hundred and seventy-five for So Ready and one hundred thousand for Von Holly. Yeah. Well, um, on So Ready, if I, my memory's right, you were to set up some kind of criteria to judge over this three-year period if they met their goals and obligations so we got a way to know whether we want to get an objective way to go forward or not go forward and we did set up very specific outcome requirements um, they're listed in the contractual agreement I can give you each a copy of that if you're, if you're interested in knowing I just want to know you're done you know I did. <laughs> we did it for sure 
and uh, we will have quarterly reports from them. I think their first one's not due till April, uh, but you know, we'll be having on a quarterly basis for, uh, updates from them. The first quarter went a little longer because they had the they had processes, contracts put in place, and people to hire, so there was nothing to report. So we allowed them some time before they came in to report because they would just come in and report that they're going to bring someone on staff and entering into contracts. So. Uh, facility maintenance, um, you'll let's see that. The budget went from what was adopted three million two hundred seventy thousand four hundred ninety nine to three million five hundred thirteen thousand five hundred, and that seems like a significant increase. You know, three hundred thousand or so. Um, well, two hundred thirty. For 250,000, the uh, there's no additional FT in their budget. Remember that this department is an overhead department, so this isn't a fully loaded burden to the general fund. It's spread between all departments, and whether they're a general fund department or dedicated fund determines where the revenue comes from, how it's charged out. But the um, the difference here really is because of the way that we're handling the library, um, and you guys are going to have to bear with us for a budget year because. What we're doing with the libraries is really still up in the air because we haven't gotten an agreement with the library district yet about um, leasing the buildings from us. We're, we've, we've proposed to lease them all of the books and computers and building and everything that goes along with running a library at no cost to them, um, with the exception of maintenance. I mean, they, they have to pay to maintain the buildings. and. Um, they're making demands in that negotiation for the county to provide a guarantee of a future transfer of the buildings, which we can't do. Our bond council has recommended against us doing that while they're still debt outstanding. Um, they're making demands for us to provide transfer of the personal property immediately. And as I've explained to them, some of the personal property was purchased with bond revenue. Some of it we, was pre-existing bond revenue, and we're not going to try to go in and determine which was which when we can wait five years and transfer everything if that's what the board decides to do. So they're being they're being fairly out, I'm gonna say they're being difficult about it um, in making these demands that we're we're not going to agree to. The county has all the risk in doing that, they have no risk. And we've asked them why the push or why are you what and the only answer that I've got is that there are board members who don't believe that they'll be on the board in five years and they want to be able to take the credit for getting the buildings from the county. That's just not a good enough reason. There's really no other reason that they've provided at this point, and we've asked them over and over. And I have copied all the commissioners on my communications with them, so they're aware of what's going on. But the way that the maintenance is funded would be direct, direct if we have a lease agreement with them through the facility maintenance rather than through the county with the contract we have for full services right now. So that's that's kind of why the difference is there. You want to add anything to that, Harvey? The only other charge is going to be for uh, insurance. So we're insuring the, the facilities and we're charging them as well. And then there's some uh, outside maintenance that, you know, for the you know, grounds, etc., that was previously funded in the library's budget. But um, we're going to have to take that over as well. So that increased the, the charge just a little bit. But that's the maintenance charge that they, they're going to have to pay to take care of the building. So there is the insurance. I didn't forget about that. Yeah, we're going to, that's what our proposal is in this facility maintenance budget is we put all those charges uh, in one place and then we'll charge the library district. Our, our issue, the reason why I tell you this is up in the air is that, you know, for whatever reason, if the library district won't agree to take the buildings for free and use all of our equipment and material, we're going to come to the point of having to close the libraries because we can't have people operating our libraries without having an agreement to either pay us to take care of them uh, or take responsibility for taking care of them. And uh, so, I mean, it's getting critical. I mean, we're, we need some lead time to be able to do that if, they're, if they really literally don't want to enter into a free lease agreement with us, with the exception of paying for maintenance. And so that's why I'm telling you this is, this is you know, subject to change. Well, if we get to the free, it seems like an old grade. <laughs> Let's see, Mike, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. what's the problem? I mean, 
if I was on the other side, I'd say, oh, great, there any charges. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of our logic as well. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't really know what to say. I, I, I don't know if one of the commissioners want to weigh in on that. Uh, I've been looking for a reason. I can't find one, and, and, I, and I believe it's what Danny said, is that somebody really wants to have that on their resume as part of their time on the board that the, you know, the buildings were transferred and you know, they separated from the county completely. Um, that seems to be their overriding objective over and above you know, getting just the operating um, issues taken care of where they can actually operate a library in the facilities that we have. And that's just been my take on it. Um, I haven't had any direct contact with uh, anybody on the library board, but I can't see any other reason. We yeah, haven't talked with anybody who's been um, in the e emails, and it doesn't make any sense, but I don't know if it's a lack of communication between um, <coughs> the two sides. But, um, well, we're, we're communicating, a lot of just yeah. so you know, we're, we're a lot. We're documenting all of our communications because that's the way I like to make but sure. With, but their board as a whole, though, you know, one on one, I, I haven't been on any, to any of their meetings. And we it's been through council. We should. It's been through council, and I think that's by design. But there's a lot of communication. I've yeah, well, typically when we do negotiate contracts, the board doesn't, a member of the board doesn't do that. The board authorizes no. the county administrator to do that. So that's why that happens that way. Uh, and you know they don't try to may, may try to pick politically at it, but they haven't tried to contact me personally. Yeah. So I mean, they they have told us now that if we don't agree to authorize, which makes no sense. I mean, a lease agreement isn't a purchase agreement. It's not a you know land sale agreement. But they want in the lease that will guarantee that we will transfer the buildings at the end of the lease. And there's a lot of reasons that you know we may not want to do that. For example, there could be something that happens that causes compression in the bond. Collection for the bond payments could be affected in five years. There could be changes in law. There could be the ability to refinance the bonds, and then we have someone else holding right to title ahead of our ability to refinance bonds. And I could go on and on. All the reasons why <coughs> we're proposing we not do that until the buildings are paid for. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I think bond council is right to. to Recommend to you that you can't separate the asset from the bond flow. So, yeah. so that's 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 where we're standing. But you know, who knows how it will get sold publicly once it, they said that they're going to pass an order demanding these things at the county if we didn't agree to them. And I said, well, I have, I've had it. Pass your order, I guess. So, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, the county. You know, I, I'm. I, I'll be totally happy to be out of the library business and not have responsibility for the buildings and have the district running them and have them going. Uh, because the libraries have, I mean, for those of you that have been here through all of that, have been fiercely political. Uh, because they're, you know, the, uh, they're below the line, I guess, Dick, is that what we used to call it, on, on required services, and they, they got, you know, reduced. And I realize there's political differences in that opinion, but they have taken, there's been a lot that's happened with the libraries over the last eight years. Yeah. Well, all I gotta do is look at some of the board members on the library and can understand the issue. And, and it's doing nothing to inhibit their ability to run effectively or efficiently. Um, it's, it's a matter of just being a good steward of a, of a substantial public uh, resource with those buildings and, and making sure we're doing what's responsible and, and proper course and that they from what I've seen don't seem to be uh, at all sensitive to that well, too much uh, history yeah. is there a, do we still have a board member uh, as a liaison or representative of the library mm -hmm. there's somebody that's a we used to uh, yeah, we, we used to, but you know, they used to be liaison to the library advisory committee. <coughs> we no longer have a library advisory committee. So there's not there's not a connection that way. Um, we still have the law library that the county's required to manage and we do that and we have in the library in the we we essentially moved those from a library budget into the uh, CAO's budget, but you know, we lost a position, gained a position, so we have one full time person over there. And then we also have mail courier service, which used to operate in the library. And that's another thing that, you know, I mean, I suppose the library district could hire their own, you know, 
we're going to still have to carry your services because we used to use the library system to facilitate that. Well, here's the other reason why we told them that we can't just say we're going to transfer the buildings, and that's one of the reasons. But for example, the city of Ashland's our agreement with them says, and I'm going to paraphrase this. I've, I've reviewed every single agreement you all know over the last eight years multiple times. But Ashland says if the county stops operating a library system, then the building reverts to them. So we just can't give a building that's not even going to be ours to the district now. I assume Ashland will agree that the district can run it, but it, you know, we have all of these agreements that are already contractual that we can't enter into another contractual agreement. City of Central Point, where it's a, uh, you know, City Hall is co-located with the libraries. There's provisions in there. The Jacksonville Library, the, the City of Jacksonville owns the ground under the library. There's, I mean, there's all of these things that we just can't go. Yep, yeah, they're yours uh, because they're all things that need to be worked through and negotiated and documented so that they're clean contractually. And some places may not agree to that. I mean, it's possible. Uh, so, you know, but yeah, RCC is another, you know, there's a contract there for use of services. And I would assume the district's going to continue to facilitate that, but I can't, you know. But that is another reason why we wouldn't transfer them now. While well, we have ownership, then we can agree to that. I mean, right? So. That'd be a major board of the community college. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they're not going to have a contract, though, Dick. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying those are all provisions that we have to work through all of those. And I just gave you a handful of examples. I can give you Medford. The parking is not belong to the library. It belongs to the city. And there's a contract with, a, with the county about using parking, not with the library district. So all of those are additional reasons why we wouldn't just say, yep, yeah, we're guaranteeing you the building. Because we don't have the authority, but well, we, uh, we could violate other contractual agreements and, you know, be sued over that, but not a smart move, really. And it's been such a short time since it's all happened into the district. I mean, they're really fighting off, trying to bite off a lot without understanding. Yeah. Well, what the district chair said to me is that the voters passed this district as a mandate to separate the library system from the county. And what I said to them was that was not at all anywhere mentioned in the reason for the taxing yeah, districts, yeah. right? So, I, but I believe that's their perception. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, they're pushing to do that. And at the appropriate time, we'll be happy to accommodate that. It's just, it's not the appropriate time. I'm gonna grab county council real quick. Harvey, while he's doing that, grab county council real quick. It shows that the annual square footage costs are going down. From 226 to 211, yeah, the total budget's going up. What am I missing? Oh, like yes, so uh, basically what's happening here is that, uh, you know, again, we're not going to be maintaining the, the library as part of the county facility. So they're out it's of the outside, calculation. That's why it's going down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, uh, one of the things that happened is when we moved the services from their current facility, one of the things that we didn't mention, but we did, as we mentioned, that what we did is we took all the history from the libraries and then we just dumped that all into the kind of administration. So we did take the law library and the mail courier services, but when you look at the history of the ground title of the apartment, you'll see an extra $7 million all of a sudden show up. <coughs> That's what the total budget was for the library. But it just be on this one. We did that so that we could show basically. Since we won't have a library department anymore, it wants to come it will start showing in our history as a $7 million increase because it's now in our budget and not separated. But it won't be an ongoing expense. It will be in the history. Uh, County Council. Hi, Joel. Hi, Danny. 
Do you know everybody here? I believe I've met everybody to some extent. Um, I was the interim county council during the last budget um, cycle, and so I came in and presented um, both to this meeting and then to the, the April hearings. Um, I was appointed county council on a permanent basis in May. Um, at the time of the last budget, we were two employees down. We were normally staffed for four FE attorneys. At the time, we only had two um, filled. Um, as of September of last year, both of the positions have been filled and both of those employees are still employed, so we're up to full staff again. So really just, I'll give you a chance to go over anything you think is critical, but sure. so everyone knows, this budget's essentially status quo. The increases is, is, are, are due to the, you re recall, I said I was gonna budget a 1.75% cost of living adjustment, uh, adjustment. That's done in all of the budgets. That's after having provided no cost of living adju uh, adjustment since three years ago, so for two budget cycles. So um, that's an increase. They had a slight increase in their medical because we did increase the manager's plan 7% this year in payroll. That's the first increase we've had in the plan in five, in the, in the five years, this would be the fifth year. So, you know, average, I guess a little over 1% a year increase in medical costs for the manager's plan. All of Joel's staff are exempt because of the work they do, whether they're in management or just confidential employees. Um, and so there's no change in FTE. Uh, they are on their budget target. Actually, uh, I say this proud, proudly, $275 below their budget target. Fund. And... Uh, Whatever else you want to add, Joel? Uh, well, we just had three line items where we had more than a 3% change. Um, one was in membership and dues, and that is because now that we're up to full staff, we're trying to take as much litigation in-house. That's been the plan ongoing, but now that we have um, the two attorneys who I hired have significant litigation experience, and so we're bringing them in. Um, therefore, we had a membership to it's the association. It's called the Oregon Association of Defense Counsel. It's essentially an Oregon-based um, group of attorneys who defend um, corporations and, and provide defense counsel. Um, it's a very good resource, especially since we're going to be handling a lot of this inside. Um, we had an ex increase in self-insurance expense that was based upon our chargeback. And then we had an increase in um, education registration. Um, last year, one of my confidential employees applied for tuition reimbursement as she pers pursuant to the county policy. Um, it was approved by the county administration. And so that's an additional expense in my budget. But even with all these three line items and that have increased more than 3%, as Danny said, we're still below our budget target. Are you able to keep up with the workload? At the current level, we are. Um, if, if litigation should increase in the future, um, we may either have to look at sending more work outside, which is expensive, um, or look at somehow um, adding to staff. At this point, though, we do have sufficient staff to handle the workload. Um, it's tough to predict who's going to sue the county for what coming into the future. Um, but we have, just having looked at it, we haven't seen an increase in the four years I've been here, first as an assistant county council, now as the county council. We are seeing more lawsuits coming in, um, and so that is requiring more resources. And we are fighting a lot. A lot of the lawsuits are coming from the jail. And We're fighting those because we're not just going to pay out, and, and we're prevailing. People claiming, you know, making claims, violation of civil rights, those kinds of things. And we've prevailed in the last two cases, I think, that we've had it, so yes, far it's that have been before judge. The other thing is, is, and this won't die down for a while, but we're managing the GMO litigation in house. So we're doing all of that internally, which is way less expensive than hiring some firm to defend us probably by three or four hundred dollars an hour easily um, and so but we're doing all that else and that has increased workload significantly for them while that is occurring <coughs> anybody got any other questions for Joel you look nice today Joel well thank you very much Dan. <laughs> <laughs> thanks all right I appreciate it I made a projection at the time I did the budget targets for the most recent 12 months. For the most what? For the most recent 12 months. 
it's probably going to be higher than what I budgeted by the time we get out because you know more inflation is becoming more inflationary right now. Uh, but I, I do it on the most recent data I have available, so the last 12 months. We use different CPIs. Now this is the 1.75 is for managers and confidential employees. Uh, and we use different CPIs based on contract requirements for the unions. And those get measured over a pre-identified period of time. And I do have to guess, estimate that, which I've done in the budget, but I'm estimating it. And may, you know, I, I, I don't, when, when it says from you know July to June 30th, when I'm doing the budget in December, then I just. On, on non-contract, uh, Folks, uh, do you have any particular uh, place you point to? Or? Yeah, I think we use. I'll, I'll have to go look for sure, but I think it's uh, all urban west is what we use. All urban west. Yeah, the CPI all urban west. But I'll have to check. Let me because we use a whole bunch of different ones. But I think that's one we. You know. That would help me a little bit. Yeah, I actually have a sheet that talks about. Uh, that's a memo that that I prepare for payroll. That tells them what to budget by every contract, what to load in the payroll system by every contract, and that is for CPIs, health insurance, you know, everything that is affected by contracts go through each of those. They load that in the payroll system, the department downloads the payroll system, adjusts for whoever's due a step increase and that kind of stuff. So, but I have a memo that will that I'll get for I'll give for everybody if you yeah, if you guys want a copy of it. Sure, okay. Yeah, I'll give I'll give you all a copy of that. So. Well, that will speak to the. I'm not arguing against you or anything. Right. Information I could use for yeah. the college. Yeah, sure. My guess is if the college is doing it now, it's going to be higher than 1.75. I, I kind of locked us in when it was. Hmm. Yeah, they're up to two point. I mean, it's just growing. Five range. Yeah, in our case though, too. Remember, we didn't do a CPI for three years or two budget cycles, so I mean, there there was an adjustment that we that we didn't get. We didn't do it, so we're we're probably we're probably a little bit behind because of that. But I'm fine with that. I mean, it's okay. I, uh, I need your argument because I think they're a little high. The college, you think, is a little high? Yeah. Like I said, I think they're probably going to be higher than us. Hi, Shannon. Hello. You get to Good pick. Morning. I mean, you can have whichever chair you want. It's, I, if I were you, I'd sit next to April, not really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No offense. So let me talk a little bit about, this will be of interest to all of the uh, lay members for sure, because you haven't been really uh, a lot involved. I have tried to copy you on email. But Shannon's office took over, and with Tracy's assistance as well on the budget side, but the accounting side, Shannon's office took over the financial responsibilities of the Fair and Expo. Um, so we, we have a contractual agreement with them. It saved the Fair and Expo about $80,000 a year to do that. We've been trying to get them to do this for about two years, uh, and it took them getting into a crisis before they finally agreed that it was a good thing. Uh, Shannon. Eric and Tracy have done the majority of the work in terms of um, bringing their information uh, up to an, an accurate reporting level, but we're still fine tuning. But Shannon essentially found that they were reporting their revenues fairly accurately, I mean, over 90% accurately, uh, but their expenses they were only reporting about 44% accurately. So when they were costing events, they had no clue what they were really costing them to do something. Well, that's a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Shannon's done a lot of work. We also had an issue with their separate checking account. They have a checking account that's meant to be able to make payment immediately because when they contract with certain people, it requires an immediate payment. We've written a policy for how that will be managed. For years, it's been recommended that they write a policy. They finally asked us if we could do it for them because they didn't get to doing it. Um, and we're writing other operational policies around finances with Shannon and Eric's assistance. Tracy helped, and Tracy will manage day to day the budget for the fair, so she is the one that helped prepare the budget with the executive director from the fair, the new interim executive director. But that's a work that is a workload increase in Shannon's budget, and also um, our. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. Sh Shannon, it, I guess what I'm getting at, Shannon's added some FTE to her budget. That's one of the issues. The other issue is that the purchasing card program has kind of just blown up for us, which is good because we, we really, ch Shannon's office has really tried to uh, be <laughs> almost enforce the use of purchasing cards because we get rebates. So it's essentially, you know, it, it generates a significant revenue and channel will have those numbers, I'm sure, today to talk about. But that program got so large that we needed to bring on extra staff for it. Still a net for us to use them, but it's just, it's just, it's, it's great because we're, you know, we've kind of converted most purchases that we can over to that program, but it's, you know, it's creating a significant amount of work. And then there's some movements of FTE between duties within her budget where they're spreading out the work differently. Uh, and so I'll let Shannon talk about that. Shannon's uh, budget for finance, uh, she did meet her budget target. So the additional FTE aren't being supported out of the budget target. Well, they may be supported out of the budget target, but within the budget target we gave her like we gave everyone else. And as I said, most of that's going to be from revenue and from contractual uh, agreement with the fair and expo that the additional staff are supported by. So you take over from there, Shannon. <laughs> I don't know what's left. Um, we'll talk about some of the numbers. Yeah, I can talk. Um, so the actual the, the fair and expo is not in here because that happened after the budget um, was created, although I guess I had some foresight into it. Um, like Danny said, I added an FTE primarily for the purchase card. It was being um, managed by the payment center tax staff, but um, it's too big. <laughs> you know, they were doing it kind of in their extra time back when it was a lot smaller. And so Shannon, is that more about processing support, or is it about compliance testing, or, uh -huh. or both? <laughs> yeah, both. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And there's also, this last year, um, I had one of my accountants do a campaign to our vendors and uh -huh. get more people to sign up. Yeah. And so we saw a, a huge incremental growth. Our um, spend, or our, on the purchase card in 2013, we had $3.8 million go through it, and last year we had 6.3. And so nice. there's still a lot of opportunity there, mm -hmm. but it just didn't have the staff that can actually, you know, when I go through the check register, I'm like, why isn't that paid? Why isn't that yeah, paid? Yeah, so right. I just need more staff to do that. Yeah. And then in addition, this provides more coverage for our accounts payable department, you know, because right now it's one person. So if she's on vacation or if she's sick, then one of my key accountants covers for her. and. Now I know that I you know I need her for the fair and I need her to do other things too. So it's just providing um, us with more coverage there. Um, and then the other shift he mentioned, um, you know, I, between tax and property management. So taxation is a collection of property taxes, and then property management is the management of any county-owned properties um, and including foreclosures. And that department's booming, <laughs> and so I've moved some allocated some staff over there. So and let me tell you one thing that we don't know, it's not represented in this budget, and we'll, we're going to go to work on this, but the measure that just passed for taxing marijuana requires that the that Shannon's office collect the tax. So we're going to have to develop an infrastructure within the system we have um, that will cost, which will be paid for by the collection of the tax. Um, that's a ways down the road. It may, you know, may not even happen this fiscal year, depending on what the legislature does. The legislature has a Senate Bill 542, 542. Mm -hmm. 542 that essentially will authorize local governments to tax um, because, I don't know if a lot of people know this or not, but our, our tax was just to cover the unincorporated in the area in our county, the cities all passed a tax, so people weren't voting to whether we have taxes county overall, they were voting whether we were going to have taxes in the unincorporated area. And the cities, you know, people were upset that <laughs> that we spent money on an election, which is odd to me because the voters are the ones that required we have an election, not the county. It's by our charter. And our county charter says any time the board wants to consider a tax, it requires that we have a, a vote of our electorate. The cities aren't required to do that. I suppose if, I, if it were me, I'd be upset that the cities were able to do it without me getting the way in rather than be mad at the county that we had an election got to decide for themselves but you know we took a pretty big amount of heat over uh, having that election um, 
the cost of the election would have been a cost to us whether we did it now or waited. We still we, we pay our proportionate share of an election regardless of what time we hold the election. So it's it's not a big surprise that we had an election. And really, I guess if you look at the numbers, I think we had a little over fifty thousand people vote. So if it does cost a hundred thousand, which I, I doubt, but we haven't got the final numbers, you know, people got to weigh in for about two dollars a person, which seems pretty reasonable to me. But uh, we'll see because this is going to require us to set up an infrastructure, probably work on creating some ordinances around um, identification of you know people that meet the tax criteria, and so we're going to be working on that here pretty shortly. And collecting the cash. It's all going to be cash. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to deposit that. Huh? Yeah, we can deposit yeah. all the tax. <laughs> 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 the state of Colorado did a really good presentation at a um, municipal finance conference last October, and it was a keynote speaker, and he was just talking about how some of the surprises that they found when they instituted a tax and one was just the massive amounts of cash that was used. I think there's a federal legislation that may change that too. Yeah. May allow them to actually have bank To accounts. actually be banked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, anything else you can think of, Shannon? Did a good job, as usual. Could, could I ask one question? Absolutely. Just to refresh my memory on this, how, do, how this purchase card system works. Okay. Run through it. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's administered through Bank of America, and we have two different pieces to the program. One is actual physical cards that people use to make purchases. So whether they're at a store, or they're doing an online purchase, or they're traveling. So it's basically a credit card. And so then for every dollar we spend, we get 1.4% um, back in a rebate every year. And then we also have a second part of it, it's called ePayables, where the invoices actually go into our accounting system. And then instead of cutting a check, we, um, each of the vendors that are set up in the ePayables program, they have a ghost card. So they basically have a credit card number that has no limit, it has zero limit. There's like zero available on the card until we load it. So if we put in an invoice for $100, <coughs> Then um, we send a file to Bank of America. It says, "Okay, this card is authorized for $100," and then the vendor charges $100, and then it nets back out to zero. And they can't charge any other time other than when we've authorized for an invoice. And so then we get a uh, rebate on those. And talk purchases. about the controls we have in place to make sure that we yeah. <laughs> well, how much of a rebate do you get on that? It's the same, 1.4%. Uh -huh, Our total rebate last year was $88,000. Um, so the controls in place um, for the purchase card for the people who have the credit cards, there's a policy around what type of purchases are allowed. Um, they have to have receipts to back up their purchases, and if it's a meals, they have to have itemized receipts and you know with their um, charging. Basically, you're just you agree that you owe this money, you're authorized in the bank yep. to go ahead and pay it, but, but they have to then build. Uh, email the bank in a sense to say we want to collect it. It's like an auto pay. Yeah. Or, or they automatically automatically pay. goes to their merchant account. So okay. for the e payables program, everything the controls are exactly the same. The invoice comes in, it has to be approved, it goes through our accounting system exactly like a check, but instead of us actually writing a paper check, the vendor gets an invoice or a, excuse me, an email that says your card is now ready to charge you can now charge this amount. So they put it through like any other Visa or MasterCard charge. So Dick, we have almost the exact same program at the university and doing business this way is, is, is pretty much a, an accounts payable best practice. Mm -hmm. So who pays the rebate? Like the, the, the bank. bank. Well, but where are they getting the money? Well, because they earn every time mm -hmm. A vendor from, from the merchant. That's right. The, yeah. the merchants have whatever agreement with their particular bank. And Do you handle yeah. contract uh, where you have to go out and get something and contract it? Do you handle that somewhere? We, uh, for the actual card? Yeah. yeah. It's actually through the city of Portland and they manage it. It's a statewide consortium. So um, any municipal municipality within the state can 
be in this program, and then all of our purchases are aggregated to determine how large our rebate is every year. And, and we, we could also bid, we could have a separate provider. We just piggyback on their contract because it's a good contract. But we could bid, if someone wanted to come and offer us 4%, then you know we would jump on board with it. But, right. but they, they won't. Because this, you know, the, the mass that we have under the Portland contract is huge, so the rebates are larger as well. So the cost is somewhat the same, except for writing a check. Right, it's actually less. But you get revenue back because of the volume of purchase. We get revenue back, and then we don't have to print the checks. We don't have to mail the checks. Right. Um, right. You know, so right. it's actually right. a lower cost option. So that's I was just trying to figure out where it saves us money. It saves yeah. us money and we get a refund. And a That's couple right. of other things I want to add in the systems of checks and balances. So when a purchase card statement comes in, it does require the employee to review, but also their supervisor, mm -hmm. the department that has to sign off on it there. So it's essentially 100% audit of purchases. And so we do occasionally have people that purchase something that they weren't supposed to purchase. And we typically discipline someone when they do that, unless it was, you know, for example, if someone's at a hotel room and they wake up in the morning, they've charged the card for the room charges they bought room service but already received a per diem. We're not gonna discipline someone for that. We do require them to reimburse the county, and, you know, the county. Uh, but uh, if someone goes out and we haven't had anything agreed, just like someone buying, you know, something for their house furniture or something like that. But if they did, they would be disciplined, probably terminated for something like that. But, um, so we have we have good grip, good, good grasp on it. It's a great program, so Chance. The, the rebate amount, that's just all going to general fund and the, the, the entire Number it goes back into their budget. Okay, so it goes to the individual department. Thereby reduces the need for some general fund support for the department. Right, right. and it's internal service, so it just reduces my chargebacks to all the departments. So it makes the cost for all departments less. But it doesn't get attributed directly to the department, the department that actually did the charge. No, it reduces sure. their expenses though. Yeah. For, for all and I do it pro rata based on their spend. I just wondered if there'd ever be any kind of an issue when you know if it's a. HHS and you know there's the they get the reduction you know prorated based on their total expenditures against the full pool okay. so there wouldn't there there would never not be an issue okay there could be an issue could be an issue if you're taking dedicated funds and nothing in the general fund that's what you're that saying was kind of what I was getting at it but it's yeah it's that that that, that okay. happened that way on the accounting fair when you get through uh, getting everything set up yes. Will you be able to project a budget by a event? Yes, I am developing a um, activity-based costing model for them so that um, they can actually project how much an event will be based on the venues that they're going to have the event and how long the venue is going to be. As I understand it, it's direct cost, then it's direct indirect cost, and then it's overhead costs. So right. you've got a pretty good idea of what the out-of-pocket costs are. Mm -hmm. Then the next level would be the, the electric bill and some of the other things that are <coughs> directly uh, used. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, some method for allocating the overhead, which is always a judgmental kind of right. thing. But you get a pretty good idea at the bottom of the first two, mm -hmm. right? Right, because you get your contribution margin for right. absorbing. contribution margin mm -hmm. for the event. Uh, will you be able to take this new budget for 15, 16? Will this be ready so you can project that out? <coughs> for the 15, 16 budget, we went back and looked at that history. And then we allocated cost based upon the initial yeah. yeah so she did a better allocation <coughs> between fair and intern events. But I mean, will there be a projected uh, plan by event? Yes, we'll be able to yeah. do that. But I don't it's know if it will be. I don't know if it'll budgets. be ready in the in this budget. No, no but I mean, yes, by the, yes, yes. And, and it's actually automated. There, the, she's worked with IT to generate, and, and actually, the fair can even do it. And where you talk about essentially the discretion or subjectivity and allocation, that's where. We said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll create a starting point. Chance said we'll create a starting point. And then Tracy worked based on their history and the new, working with the new fair director to see if they agreed to those allocations. Right. So they're not our yeah, independent, made-up allocations. They're theirs, really. Yeah. They're theirs yeah. with, with 
but let me just say this. <laughs> with these two people's input, which is very valuable, especially because there is no finance person at the fair anymore who ha has a history, whether that history was correct or not. And the directors knew. So um, it did require a ton of work on our part. And I've asked our staff to put a ton of work in on this up front so that we get it perfectly refined so we can do exactly what you're saying. And what, then, which, then as the events transpire, we will have budget to actual say, here's by what event. you said you would do, here's what you really, really right. did, yep. and then here's uh, the adjustment, good or bad. And we won't have two forward. sets of books anymore. Right. Well, I mean, one of the biggest problems was they allocated everything, or not everything, a lot of things, 50% to fair and 50% to interim mm -hmm. events. So you could be down the road, you could be in rodeo season, and 50% still goes to fair, and 50% still goes to interim events. So you weren't getting a, a true picture of what the fair costs, yeah. so. I was always curious, I was curious about the one in your memo. Uh, uh, electricity, I mean, when you put the fair on, that must be a huge consumer of electricity mm -hmm. in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, that, Will you be able to identify that as such and put in? Yep, that'll be a direct cost to that the fair. That'll be a direct cost mm -hmm. to the fair. Right. Okay. It, they could have done that all along, though, Dick. I mean, we've well, been yeah, pushing I mean, them for, well, I know for as long as I've been here to. First thing I asked the guy, what's uh, your events? Uh, I can't do it. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest, uh, uh, you know, this is probably a little biased, but the biggest change in the fair's ability to succeed is now that we're managing their finances because they just struggled all the time and they didn't they didn't want to give up that control. And I don't think they've actually felt a loss of control. I feel like they feel like they've had the input they need. They're getting information. Shanna's going to their meetings to report to them all their financial reports and explain them to them, which were difficult for them to understand before. And I think it will make a huge difference in their ability to be successful. Is there any chance that uh, you would have that by April? Projection for next year by May. Maybe mid April. When when when's their budget hearing? You mean by the budget hearing? I I don't know. I, I mean <laughs> best to let them put this together in a yeah, 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 don't worry. No, I would know that we've got a yeah. great outcome. I, I, I don't, don't want know. I don't want yeah. one rushed that's yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not sure if I want just, one that yeah. I just got It'll some be tight. confidence. We're yeah. we're gonna say no. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't want to. I don't want to put. We we are working would we be, methodically would through we every be little. on the mailing list for the first sure. <laughs> first sure. report. First report. Yeah, I typically I yeah. copy you three. And the I mean, this is such a high budget for this. Yeah. 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 When we get to the fair budget, we'll, we can talk more about it. But yeah, I think this this will really will literally be. You know, we have we talked about facility maintenance. We have approached them about letting us take over their facility maintenance too. So then all they have to worry about is the fair and events because they really struggle with dealing with maintenance. We're great at it. All of our buildings are maintained well. Yeah. It wasn't a huge cost savings. In fact, it may cost them a little bit more, but the level of service will be you know, exponential. Huge to step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. So we're trying. And a new, I think a real new cooperation between the two entities, too. Mm -hmm. So on full-time equivalents, I, I see the 7.3, and I hear you talking about two other people. Is the 7-3 inclusive of, of those changes? Yeah, we have one additional person, and then they shifted some people around. We're not oh. adding more people okay. because we took okay. on the fair. This okay. is yeah. essentially, we, 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 we needed more FTE because of that. Yeah. But this is essentially because of the purchasing card right. program, and then they're going to spread out the savings from moving that all into one place from people's spare time to allowing Shannon to manage the, the fair and expo and having staff assist her in that. So the seven three was yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. And the person that was covering for accounts payable when the accounts payable clerk was not there for whatever reason is going to be one of the key people doing the fair. So it all shifts and works out well. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Yeah. Oh. Good job, Shannon. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Justice Court um, came in over their budget target, but in their case, that's a good thing. In other words, they're projecting a larger revenue than we projected at 1.5%. Um, by $97,684. And I want to talk to you about why that is. 
Um, you don't have the budget history in front of you. You will when you have your budget binder. But if you remember a year and a half ago, we were looking at having to potentially close our justice court because of the legislative changes. We cut the revenue back $250 million in that budget. We went and fought and we prevailed in getting that legislative action reversed and now we're seeing the income come back that we lost. This isn't additional income per se from people going out and writing tickets and charging people. This is additional income because of the share of proceeds being corrected from what the legislature did that caused it to be uh, reduced. So there's not additional traffic staff, there's not additional tickets uh, that are driving this number. There are, you know, as you, as I'm sure Joe Charter will probably do as he does each year, bring you a graph that shows you the increase in traffic citations that is you know, trended upward ever since the beginning of the Justice Court. Um, so there are increases in citations, but not necessarily is that what is leading to the increase in revenue. Because the truth is those citations don't actually become revenue for about nine months. So uh, most of what you're seeing here is because of the change in law. I'll let uh, Judge Chart, he didn't ask for any additional staff. No, he'll see a marginal uptick in his caseload. We are on course to build the new Justice Court. We've signed the agreement to acquire the property. Um, we have the design elements done. We're within the budget that we currently have, which was a million and a half for property acquisition and construction. And so that's coming along. Uh, you know where LTM's headquarters are, Super 8 Motel? Yeah. It's kind of it's right across from Super 8, one line on the LTM side, back side of LTM. So, uh, Judge Charter, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Uh, I was just explaining to them that you came in uh, over your budget target, which is actually a good thing for us, uh, and I explained why. Um, I kind of, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk with you yet. Um, kind of explain to them revisiting the legislative history of the share of proceeds having had our budget reduced and that's been correcting itself now and so we're seeing an increase because of our share of proceeds rather than necessarily a large jump in the caseload although you have a trend upward in caseload over the years anyways and that's about as far as I got with it so I'm going to give you the floor and okay. talk about your budget. Uh, All right well we have some unknowns uh, even at this point, uh, the legislature, there's a bill to make uh, all local courts recording courts, not courts of record, but we have to record the proceedings. So we don't really know what the, those costs may entail. We'd like to um, begin scanning documents and become, use less paper as a new building because we have less room for file storage and we're just starting to investigate those costs. The other thing I've talked about in the past, you know, is uh, we have uh, one of the highest uh, cases per clerk volume, I think, of any case, of any courts uh, in the state. Uh, Jackson County uh, in uh, 2014 had 19,520 violations cases. Uh, we do that with four clerks and that's pushing about 5,000 cases per clerk. Um, other examples around the state, uh, Marion and uh, Washington County, about 23,000 violations cases with seven clerks. Clackamas, 21,000 with eight clerks. Right here in Medford, they do about uh, 15,000 with six clerks, so two more clerks. 4,000 plus cases. Now they also do criminal cases um, in the municipal court, and so that takes more time. But, um, so I'm leading up to, not this year, but probably next year we're going to be back here uh, asking for that fifth uh, clerk position. Uh, we're cler currently making do with the four clerks and uh, one on contract services, temporary services, who comes in just on court days. Um, I just came back from conference, uh, spring conference. Uh, you know, the purpose of the uh, Justice Court here has been to reduce traffic fatalities. We, we 
started down about two thirds from where we started uh, ten years ago when there were about 45 uh, fatalities in 2004. We've been down to about 15 per year in the last several years. Uh, and the trend has been down statewide until last year, so ODOT is worried uh, fatalities increased 13% uh, the last calendar year statewide. So there's obviously a, a relationship to enforcement, and I think there are other counties out there who have uh, more serious financial problems and have been cutting back on enforcement, and that could have something to do with the increase in fatalities. And, uh, I'm just seeing, personally, I'm seeing a lot more people driving around <laughs> with their cell phones in their face. So, uh, uh, and that's, unless you have specific questions for me, I don't have really specifics about the budget. Um, our case volume has been trending up, and uh, we're preparing for the new building, and we're trying to be more efficient, but. Uh, have some unknowns in transferring to that new facility. Could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the recording court as opposed to the, what you call it, the court, of, well, the court that you had it today? Uh, yeah. I mean, what's the advantage or disadvantage on that? Or why are we, why are we doing that? Uh, I wish I had a good answer for that. There's one representative on Ways and Means Committee who is, uh, Sort of, I, I suppose under the rubric of better judges has a bill that first was going to make all local courts courts of record. The court of record, the appeal would be directly to the court of appeals instead of currently, if you don't like my decision on your traffic uh, citation, you get a trial de novo in the circuit court. We don't, we're not required to make transcripts of all the trials that we do. There are very few courts of record local courts around the state. There are a few. Um, so what Representative Nathanson is in this bill is uh, there are a lot of non-lawyer judges, just as the piece, particularly in Eastern Oregon, where you might not have any lawyers in a county. Um, and uh, so to regulate the qualifications of those individuals, um, they currently are attending two conferences a year. They're getting the equivalent of 24 CLE credits at those two conferences. Even the bar only requires 12 hours a year from lawyers. And these are courses specifically related to what they do. But what the bill requires at this point is uh, for them to, within one year of uh, election or appointment, uh, take a course at the National Judicial College, which is about a two-week course. So they're their budget issues for those counties to afford sending both the judge and any pro tems to the college. Uh, initially it was to make all local courts courts of record, and now it says you have to make a recording, but you're not a court of record, so basically nothing happens to that recording, you know, because you're going to have a trial de novo anyway. No one's going to be reviewing the recording. It seems to be a waste. I, I really don't know what the motivation is, but it's under the rubric of having better judges and, and uh, regulating their quality. That wouldn't affect you, but I mean, it would uh, add cost to the record thing? The recording equipment. It, it, it isn't a big deal, really. If we have to put the recording equipment in there, I mean, it's additional cost, but it's a one-time well, investment. Belong, the county uh, belongs to some kind of the county, uh, AOC. AOC. Mm -hmm. Is that something on their agenda that you would oh, shoot yeah. down or not shoot down? Or? Yes, very definitely. We're and it'll also be his professional association that probably does most of the work. Yeah, work on it. They're tracking. And, and you're right, it doesn't affect us uh, directly, but it, it, it would affect those small rural Eastern Oregon courts more. It's usually easier to get a no vote. Stop something. And that's that's the likely outcome. Yeah. Anything else? Just I mean, 
you got to be excited, right? We, we're owners of property for the new court. Hmm. We're very excited. So it's like, you know, if you've ever gone through a remodel, there are all those nitty gritty details where like, the lights here and the <laughs> cameras there and the carpet this color, the walls, you know, <laughs> all that lovely stuff. When is through. it set to be open? Done. Open. Well, we'll get it done yeah. this next fiscal year. In the next fiscal year. Oh. At, this, at this point, we're looking at the February the the other thing I don't know if you all recall this or not. I did discuss it is that they'll be co-locating a central point uh, outpost there, which means that the court will essentially have security available to them, which is something they haven't had ever before. And the city of Central Point is leasing that space from us, so it capitalizes out the cost of the additional investment for the space. That will be nice. Just keep the income coming. We don't personally write the citations, but we do collect the money when uh, the sugar and uh, citizens come in. So. And we also don't control what the state decides to do with how that money no. uh, is shared. The sheriff's got the deputies in the budget, right? Yeah, we'll talk about that. He has some ideas about it, but yes, they'll, they'll still be enforcing traffic. It, you know, again, looking at these fatality numbers, uh, enforcement has made a difference, in my opinion, in the last 10 years, and so it's it's worked out in that way. When we went to the legislature last year and testified it on this, and Judge Charter was there, and Judge Lindhouse, I think that was about it from the courts, local courts, uh, one of the strongest messages we were able to present was our reduction in traffic fatalities from traffic enforcement. So, you know, when you stop arguing about the money, uh, the truth is going from 45 deaths to 15 uh, because we're out there enforcing is pretty significant. And it was it resonated strongly with uh, the legislature when we presented those facts. And we did so in a nice, easy chart that was graphed. <laughs> you could understand. That's pretty impressive. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bench when you all you weren't here, but these two I think were here. When they're actually the only two that were here. Uh, was we uh, started from you know the current contribution at the time and went from there. So not all of that goes okay. back to the traffic team. Whatever was current, whatever the justice court was generating to the general fund outside of the creation of the traffic team at the time. So it was over and above that. They came back. And goes back to the sheriff's budget to support it. It supports six positions um, plus overhead and you know, all that. So, uh, and it, it is, it, you know, it's, it's bounced in and out of, sometimes it doesn't cover a co the cost, but the truth is we stop 30 deaths from happening. You know? So sometimes it doesn't pay for itself and sometimes it generates additional revenue and it kind of it's bounced in and out of that. And, you know, every so often we look at, you know, adding traffic where we had significant issues and he talked about deaths but we were also able to report on major injuries which are another thing that was hugely reduced from you know enforcing traffic people slow down they, they don't hit each other doing 75 they hit each other doing 45 like they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, so, I don't know Colleen you drive a long way there. Very places is at 45. <laughs> you said 45 is the speed you should be hitting coming? Yeah. <laughs> well, if there's a 75, I have your choice. Okay. Uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead and, and let me just say Mark came in under his budget target $7,245. Uh, and why don't you go ahead? Sure. Uh, by the way, 
pleased to meet you both the first time I had a chance to. So I'm Mark Decker, IT director. Um, so as you probably can see from the budget document, there are two programs. One um, doesn't have any people in it. It's basically a layaway account for computers called Computer Replacement Program. Uh, and that's where we budget to save up money every year to replace um, the PCs that county employees use, as well as the Microsoft Office software that they use. Um, and uh, that's uh, a program that was put in place about 15 years ago or something like that. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a great program because it saves the county a significant amount of money um, versus what some counties do, which is lease computers, things like that. Uh, it also allows us to do something that um, Microsoft would prefer we not do. Uh, we can avoid subscribing to their software, so rather than participate in what they call software assurance, where you're paying every year essentially for a software subscription, we just buy our software a la carte. And um, that means that when we skip an upgrade, so for example, we went from 2007 to 2013 of that software and skipped the 2010, we saved about $225,000. So uh, we're managing that program very conservatively, and um, so as a result, uh, that's gone very well. We've actually built up a bit of a surplus in that account, uh, and we're able to reduce the software contribution charge this year as well. So that's going very well. Uh, the other program is the Information Technology Program, and that's really the, the bulk of what IT does. That's where all the people are, and, and um, all of our projects and the services we provide. Um, from last year, staffing levels are pretty much the same. Um, we're, we, we just finished up probably a, a three-year slog of major infrastructure upgrades. So we spent the last three years doing some major upgrades, upgrading all the network switches, uh, going from a Novell infrastructure to a Microsoft infrastructure, and then uh, this last year deploying new phones to the whole county. And so we're looking forward to taking a breather from that kind of activity because people are pretty tired. Uh, so we're not going to be doing any major infrastructure upgrades this year. Uh, what we are going to be doing uh, is focusing on some more uh, customer-related projects. We're going to be doing significant things for the sheriff this year. Uh, the biggest dollar item is the video arraignment system, which allows the um, prisoners who are in the jail to be arraigned in the court without having to be physically transported to the court. Uh, and that system essentially pays for itself in the reduced you know, officer time and things like that. Um, and also safety benefit because you're not moving prisoners from one area to another. Uh, so that basically needs to be replaced because it's about 10 years old. The other big one is dealing with the uh, legacy crime records that they've got. So they currently use a system called Tiburon. Before that, they were using a system called New World. Before that, they were using a system called Reigns. And that old data from those old systems was never converted into the new system. But by law, they're required to keep uh, some of that stuff. And so we haven't been able to get rid of it. Um, currently, it's hosted on a, a relatively expensive legacy IBM system we're trying to get rid of. So this year, one of our significant projects is to get all that data off of the old system, convert it into a new type of database that they can continue to maintain and meet those statutory requirements, and mm -hmm. we can kill off that expensive um, IBM system. Mark, uh, yeah. when, when you buy software that is specific to a department, the department actually bears the cost of that software as opposed to your department? Yeah. 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 Uh, our chargeback model basically says, Anything we can build directly because it benefits some particular department or departments, we do so. Mm -hmm. And whatever is left over is things, you know, common infrastructure like email and things like that. Those get spread across the county based on the number of PCs in each, in each department. So, that's correct. And just a couple of things about the video arraignment. When we <coughs> put that in 10 years ago, it was one of the first things that I was responsible for when we came, when I came to the county. Um, we kind of piecemeal together funding to be able to do it from the sheriff's office, community justice, and the court. Um, what started us looking down the road of, you know, should we still be doing this, is the system 10 years ago was about twice of it, as expensive as it is today, first of all, roughly. Uh, and secondly, we're paying maintenance costs for a system that's outdated where they continue to reduce their maintenance contract and support. And it's fairly expensive. I think it's about 50000 a year that we're paying. Um, so we're making an investment in a dying system, and the, the support we're getting for that, for what we're paying, is dwindling. Um, since, you know, essentially this really is the sheriff's department that uses this, but the courts do benefit from it, because the courts use the system for attorneys to be able to present evidence, to be able to take testimony also by video arraignment. They use it for uh, inmates secured in the Department of Corrections who may be able to be a witness for a case. Um, and so it's not just the sheriff's office, and I am going to approach the 
courts about one of the benefits of the legislation we did in the Justice Court, not only was the share uh, reinstated that came to the county, but there's a portion of that share that goes to what's called court security. And video arraignment provides for a more secure court because you're not moving in inmates in and out of the public building. So I'm going to approach them about using a portion of court security funds, although this is budgeted against the sheriff uh, and community justice budgets, uh, because I do think that the court should contribute based on what I just told you. Uh, we, I don't think we've worked out how we'll manage maintenance, but that'll be something that we do in the bid process. So maybe it will be that they'll pay the annual <coughs> maintenance cost of the system or you know, some, some way uh, I think they should be involved. And so we saw some work to do as kind of more of a placeholder that Mark talked about. Yeah, definitely a placeholder. We put in $450,000 for the system, which is really just a guess until we do an RFP. And, and we did pay about, about $800,000 for it 10 years ago. Uh, and, and what you mentioned um, in terms of there needs to be an IGA basically negotiated with the court because we need a new one with a new system. And, uh, I think your point about the maintenance is, is absolutely right. Currently, the sheriff pays all of that maintenance. The court doesn't contribute to it. So. Yeah. The county is responsible to provide the facilities for courts. The state provides the staff. You could argue that that's providing the facility, although you know, we would argue back that it's not. And, you know, it is a cost reduction to the sheriff's office to not have to, and, and a security issue, not to be moving inmates back and forth between the jail and the court, courthouse. So it does require them to have, you know, if they move, they're, they're typically at least two or three deputies down in the jail, which would require us to add two or three deputies. And if you just look at an annual expense and you assign 100000 to that, you're talking 300000 a year for a $400,000 system that lasted 10 years last time. So that's... Mark talked about the cost saving. That's really what it is. Yeah. Yeah, we worked with the sheriff to get some data on that and did some rough calculations and found it amortized over the life of, I think it was about eight years, it paid for itself. And so those extra two years were cost savings. Anybody got any questions for Mark? How's the, uh, it's a, uh, the assessor uh, in their system, is that up, totally up and running? And the um, all the assessors, basically, the um, we we backed away from the uh, the replacement that they were going to do, and instead are working with the existing vendor for a major upgrade, which is in progress. They've uh, built about half of the it's like an entirely new architecture for their software. They built about half of that. Part of that's been deployed um, to the payment center, and that's just kind of an ongoing process. And they're expected to go into production with the entirely new ORCAT software in about a year and a half. To so one of the things that we did, you'll recall, is that we gave a notice of non-performance to the previous contractor. What happened was the company sold to another company, the company that bought them laid off all the people that were working on our project. They were unable to deliver for us in terms of the tax cycle. And they wanted essentially a year extension, and we said, no way, that's not working. So we did file with them a notice of non-performance and demanded a refund, which we eventually negotiated uh, and received a refund for. The infrastructure we invested in, we were able to redeploy to other areas, so it wasn't an expense out of pocket. Uh, and um, the new system, the, the, a rebuild of the pre-existing system, essentially cut the cost down. If I remember correctly, about eight hundred thousand dollars from the, the approval we had given. So it was it was a significant cost savings to go go this way. The other thing is that audit just did finish a uh, audit of assessment uh, and. One of the well, they're not they're not completed. They're in the process. They've got the rough draft. One of the things that they're going to be recommending are are benchmarks with dates identified for completion of this particular software uh, upgrade, so that we can at least hold the assessor office accountable for continuing to require Helion or what's it called now? Or yeah, it's Helion, the company. Yeah, Helion to meet the the uh, agreed upon delivery dates. So we're, we, you know, I, I'm not the assessor's boss, but we're putting everything in place contractually to try to hold it account, the system accountable for being delivered. I can't make the assessor do it. Though. The assessor wants to do it, so don't, 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 don't say that I'm wrong, but, you know, don't let me say the wrong idea here, I mean. Last I heard was quite cooperative on this system. He's got a vested interest in his success. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks, Mark. So before we uh, adjourn or end this public meeting per se, we'll have to adjourn it. Um, I just I do want to tell you that there, you're, the, the next Monday and Tuesday, you're not going to get any big surprises. Uh, every, as I said, everybody came in on their budget target. I know you'll be especially interested in the uh, expo budget, and I did move that up. So we're visiting there earlier because I think yeah. you two have a lead. Well, that now it's changed. Yes, it's changed. Yes. But so, we're so fine. We'll be here. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, you know, other than that, these should go fairly smoothly. Um, and they're as you kind of directed in your December meeting. Uh, and so, I'll, but I'll make sure we cover those points that are um, of ongoing interest to you a little more thoroughly, especially with regard to Expo. And that's it for today, unless you all have any questions. I've still got one on this. Every item is the management medical insurance. I'll walk me through a little. That's a pretty significant increase on every budget. Yeah, what we do, so in the man, management and confidential employees, that's right. where our self-insurance yes, is. Yes, yes. And we have not increased that for the last five years. Okay. Um, and it's a function of claims, so it's, it's a function it's of engineering. It's not a change from what we discussed last year. We're still going forward with the... Oh, right, right. Okay. And, you know, that that's the cost. That it's a capitated <coughs> cost based on the claims and payouts that we make, along with administration of the program, which is a third-party administrator, and reinsuring ourselves to make sure we're not at a great risk. Okay. So all of those costs get put into a rate that we determine per employee a cost, kind of like a premium. Right. So roughly what is it per employee? Uh, it's in the sheet that I'll give you all that shows what I budgeted okay. for, for each uh, okay. agency. Now, this doesn't take into account what we'll see in reductions or a slowdown of increase because of our clinic, because our, our clinic won't catch those till the next budget cycle when we go out to bid new contracts with third-party administrators, essentially. $1,427. Okay. Harvey has the form that I'm going <laughs> Did you go get this after I told him I give it to him, or did you have it before? Oh, okay. 1,470. $1,427. That's the new, uh, that's, that's the, the new rate, rate per month per employee. Per month per employee, okay. That's and we the rate, or, the, or that's the, the current new, rate. That's the new rate. Mm -hmm. And it's seven percent increase over what it was. Yeah. So, but but let me let me do explain something. On average, for all of our other groups, we're talking between thirteen and twenty percent increases. So even though the management plan went up seven percent this year, it didn't go up the last five years where all of those other plans did go up, and uh, it went up seven percent, not fifteen percent. So. The growth of cost in the self-insurance plan is way less than the growth of cost in the fully insured plans. And had we been in a fully insured plan, we would have seen annual increases that were, you know, we were getting 15 and 20 percent ourselves. That's why we looked at moving to self-insurance. So. so the 1400 per month, roughly, give or take a few dollars, that's a family plan, right? Uh, it's spread across everyone. We, okay. we don't charge a different rate for a family. We don't charge a budget a different rate for a family than we do for an individual. Now, in the retirement system, you have to. So for people that are retired, we do. And then um, in terms of you know, how that compares, so it, the management plan is probably the richest plan. It has the best benefits. But that's because we've been able to manage the cost very effectively. We haven't had to reduce benefits over time. Not because we've added a bunch of benefits, because we haven't. But it's because other plans have reduced benefits to try to negotiate when they come to the table. But if you compare that rate of $1,400 a month to what we're contributing to the sheriff's health insurance, it's $1,850 a month. So while the management plan is $1,400 a month and it's the richest benefit, we're paying 19, almost $1,850 a month for the sheriff's employees. We have, uh, well, we've budgeted. Uh, I actually don't want to say what we've budgeted because we're in negotiations for SCIU. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that was FAPO. The 1850 was the other strike bar prohibited unit, not the sheriff's. And then the sheriff's were at 1600. So still more cost than the management plan significantly, even though the management plan has better benefits. And if we could move those other people into self-insurance, uh, we, would, we would do a lot better. And so would they. 
their benefits would be better. They wouldn't have to be cutting benefits and increasing deductibles, but our costs would likely go down. We, the, one of the reasons why we, it's paying for itself sooner than we even projected, which I said when I projected it with the vendor through the um, I'll ask one point. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. That it would take longer, but because we combine or brought in road disposal, they contributed a cost to the capital construction, an upfront payment to us, and they pay us a monthly rate for utilization of the clinic. They have a separate contract with the vendor for their own services, so they pay for their own services but they're using our facility offsetting our operating costs and they paid a portion of that capital cost that we invested up front, so we're recovering that quicker. And it, and, and it is saving us money significantly because of that. The, you know, we want to get more employees associated with the facility to start to, to use it for kind of the kind of things you go to value media care for. You know, you're not going to go there for a heart surgery, but you might go there to get it. We have an EKG machine. You go get an EKG, uh, EKG at your doctor, you're probably going to pay a couple, 250 bucks. If you go over there, it costs us probably $20 to do an EKG. Uh, same thing with prescriptions. I talked about labs. We do labs on site. A lab costs us 20 bucks. Go to Providence and get the same lab or a Sante, and you're going to pay 500 bucks. So if, while we're not charging our employees for it, we're saving thousands of dollars in Taxpayer money, not you know, paying a third-party vendor for what would be insurance. Next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 going better than we even. The, and a, the word I was missing before was when we developed the pro forma for the projections. All right, yeah, we're all, we're out of here just about on yeah. time. All right, so we start uh, Monday at one thirty.